This is the Venturing Angler Podcast. In this episode, we'll be chatting with Justin Miller of the Fly Shop in Redding, California. Justin works in the travel department and has spent a great deal of his focus and his time in eastern Russia on the Kamchatka Peninsula. In Kamchatka, Justin has chased salmon, steelhead, and the enormous, aggressive rainbow trout. He's also a part of the Kamchatka Steelhead Project, an interesting uh, and very unique research project on steelhead in Russia. Let's chat with Justin. All right, we're here with Justin Miller up in Redding, California. Justin works at the Fly Shop in Redding and is um, known for his uh, fly fishing work with and in Kamchatka in eastern Russia. So, Justin, how did you come to get involved with eastern Russia? Oh, man, that was kind of a, a long game getting in, but the Fly Shop hired me straight out of college. And I just, I didn't know much. I was on those. I just wanted to fish a ton. And uh, when I got to the fly shop, I, I started meeting guys that their entire souls were dedicated to fly fishing. And they showed me the ropes. And, uh, you know, the, the only thing I ever thought about was just like that you had to just fish harder than everybody else to get recognized. And, and fortunately, I had a, a whole bunch of guys that recognized it. And one of my heroes in the world is a guy named Mike Van Warmer, who was guiding over there and had been for eight years. Canadian dude in a hardcore spay casting steelheader, and I did none of the above. I steelhead fished, but with nymphs. And he grabbed me up quick and was like, no, nah, man, I'm going to teach you how to swing, cast spay rods. And when I'm gone, you'll take my spot in Russia. And that's exactly what happened. So what exactly was his spot in Russia? Well, he was he was the head guide, <clears throat> and he just he guided every program that they did over there. He was he was the man. He was he was the guy that knew all about Russia. He was just the most charismatic guy. Still is the most charismatic guy you've ever met in your life. You, when you hung around him, you just wanted to go see the entire planet, and he and he and he really made you feel like you could. And it was just like. Dude, I'm, I'll follow you anywhere, and and that's exactly what he did. He he was legit. He was seriously serious, and he showed me the the path to get there. And when he walked away, he was like, "Justin, I, I want Justin to take my spot there." And sure enough, they were like, "Hey, you want to go to Russia? You want to be the next guy?" And I said, "Absolutely, man. I got big shoes to, to big shoes to fill." But he made me ready. Yeah, so, I mean, this is how I'd put it, but I, you're sort of like the guy for Kamchatka. Um, and what a, a lot of people I don't think realize is um, the fly shop in Reading is sort of the hub for anglers going to Russia from all over the world. Uh, so w what exactly is your role in all of that? Well, I just I got put in a really fortunate position. I mean, when Mike first was was grooming me for that spot, and then uh, and then they gave me the go ahead, and I went. It was kind of like like everybody's dream come true, right? Like I need to go to Russia once. But if you ever talk to anybody that that's been there, when you come home, your first thought is how do I get back? <laughs> And then, and then your whole life changes, right? And, and I was in a position where, where it was going to change everything because I had to go back. And so, so my whole life then revolved around it. And then, you know, apparently they liked me because I, I, I got to stay there for eight years. And then I got to see every single program. And, and I know, you know, everything we do over there. And it, it just, it was fantastic because it's all so diverse and different. You know, we're talking about an area the size of California. And so, you know, the McLeod River is far different than the L.A. River. And that, you know, we're fishing rivers that are that far apart. And uh, and so when I first got over there, you know, it was super special. But the more time I spent there and the more I learned there, the more I knew about the, the, 
entirety of the systems and, and everything was so different. And so now, you know, I'm in a great spot where when people say, hey, I want to go to Kamchatka, then then I can help you look for what you're looking for and, and, and choose between different operations because there's so much diversity over there. I, if you watch surfing films or fly fishing films, like one consistent cliche in all these films is people say, like, there's just something so special. I can't explain it. It's amazing. I can't explain it. It's like got my soul. And I've heard that similar type of language when people talk about Kamchatka. Um, Frank Smethurst uh, in the film Eastern Rises says, who spent a lot of time in Alaska, said, if you can find me any place in Alaska that's comparable to Kamchatka, like, let me know. For people like me who have never been there, I don't know what that means. Like, what is it that's so extraordinary about Kamchatka? Yeah, the, I mean, I, I hear it. The, I hear it a lot as well, and I I, I feel the same. Um, Alaska, you know, we we say a lot of the time in our in our marketing, and it's legit. Is we we say that Kamchatka was Alaska what it was a hundred years ago, right? I mean, literally, we're sending 300 anglers a year to Kamchatka to fly fish. They're selling like 145,000 non-state, out-of-state right. licenses in Alaska every year. Like, it, it's ridiculous. 300 people fly fishing in the state of California for the entirety of the season is ridiculous. And then on top of that, the fish are just, <clears throat> they're savage. Like, in all my time there, I mean, I've spent, like, 70 weeks there and, and over a year of my life, which is super special, but never once have I ever thrown an egg or had to peg a bead or done any of that stuff. These fish are ferocious. There's a third of the last remaining wild Pacific salmon on the earth spawn in Kamchatka. The other third are, another third are on Lake Iliamna, and the rest of the Pacific shares the last third. And those fish don't key in on eggs. They're still eating mammals and and bait fish, the 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 salmon smolder, the Dolly Varden young. And so they're super aggressive. They're not on the egg bite. We don't have to do the nymph thing. And we don't have to cover fish that got fished yesterday by a different lodge. You, lots of the time, you're the only person that's going to even cast into that pool for the entire year. The fish... They're super smart. They're super aggressive, but they don't know what a fly is. You put yours in, and it's obviously food, and they come and get it. It's just, it's unbelievable. You've never been in a place so wild in your life. And even for guys that have fished a lot in Alaska, it's hard for them to, like, imagine fishing a place as amazing as some of the fisheries up there, but being the only one all year to do it. That's awesome. So you mentioned... The, the salmon, if I'm not mistaken, Kamchatka's got an additional salmon that makes it so that there's six Pacific salmon. Yeah, they have, uh, they have the, the rare um, cherry salmon, AK, the Masu, and it's a pretty special fish that absolutely we just don't have in the Pacific Northwest. It doesn't cross doesn't cross the Pacific and uh, it's absolutely beautiful. It's, it's as vibrantly red as a sockeye but it has these olive drippy paint bars like a chum um but it's about five to eight pounds and the crazy thing is it actually takes mice on the surface so lots of times we'll just be fishing for the rainbows we're all we, we're always targeting the rainbows and we we catch all the other pacific salmon by catch from time to time coho we can target chum come up and eat flies every once in a while every once in a while we'll accidentally get into a sockeye but the but the cherries will actually come take a fly and it's a pretty special thing you know it's it's one of the only places in the world besides japan and mainland russia that whole part of the far east where you can actually uh take them at all and the fact that they'll come up and 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 take a fly off a trout rig is pretty impressive so speaking of mice and use the word i think predator or savages or something before almost every freaking time i see a picture of a trout in Kamchatka, it's got a, an enormous mouse fly in its mouth. Um, these things are beasts, huh? 
Absolutely. It's it's absolutely ridiculous. And that's the whole thing about it. Is sometimes I hear people talking in in Alaska and stuff and it seems like it's a gimmick. Like you can mouse fish, but you'll catch catch less fish than if you were throwing beads or something that the fish are actually keyed on. Right? Trout's an opportunistic feeder. So they might be eating eggs all day, but if a mouse swam by they might take a whack at it. In Kamchatka, it's the exact opposite. Is We're literally matching the hatch. It's not a gimmick. You know, these fish eat mice with reckless abandon. Um, I've probably seen 10 or 12 real live mice try to swim across, or across the pool in front of me, and I've never seen one survive the trek. <laughs> like, they're getting eaten. And, the, and, and you know, I mean... We're we're at we're absolutely catch and release fly fishermen, but they're so aggressive to the mouse that you know we have we have a mortality rate, right? And we keep it down. We choose flies accordingly. We regulate hook size and, and things like that. But but we accidentally kill fish. They sometimes they'll they'll hit a mouse so hard they swallow it to the throat. And when we bring that fish in, um, and he's just he's bled out. It's 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 a science experiment every single time, and I and I make the clients gather around, and I take bets. I say five bucks that this fish is gonna have more than four mice in its stomach. And the guys, come on, come on, come on. That's not you know. I mean, th- this is a gimmick, right? And nah, man, I'll take out my my sog power plier and I'll cut that fish out. And the craziest thing I ever saw is I came back to camp one time, and I'd caught a rainbow trout that was only about 22 inches long and had six mice in its stomach no way. and nothing else not a bug not an egg and uh and i got back to camp super proud about it and the, the clients were like holy smokes you know we're literally matching the hatch that's what they're eating and uh and the cook turns to me my russian cook a guy named Zhenya, he's a genius master with the knife amazing food and he turns to me and he says, Justin, this is nothing. And he pulls out his iPhone right there at the dinner table when everybody's all stoked. And he pulls up a picture of a fish that was 24 inches long. And the thing had 24 mice that he'd cut this fish oh open and he God. was going to cook it. And the, the mouse were laying next to the fish, nose up. And they were all about an inch wide. And there was this 24-inch fish with 24-inch that. 24 mice that he'd pulled out of its stomach underneath it. Like, we're, we're matching the hatch. This is not a gimmick. That's what they're eating. They that, get big and strong really fast. That's unreal. Just this week I saw a picture of what looked like about an 18-inch rainbow with, like, a 3- or 4-inch mouse in its mouth, and I couldn't get over <laughs> that alone, and that's nothing compared to what you just said. They're beasts. <laughs> if, if you guys remember Eastern Rises in 2008, my first time over there, you know, I thought this was all like, holy smokes, this is incredible. These these fish are mammal eaters. This is unbelievable. And Ryan Peterson told us the story. And then later when that movie came out, we saw the footage. The suckers were eating ducks too, right? The thing had a baby harlequin in his stomach <laughs> alongside seven mice. They just, bugs aren't a real deal over there. They're, they're meat eaters. <laughs> so are the trout there actually, the rainbows there, are they actually different than they are? elsewhere you know that's that's one of the strange things right is i I grew up a trout fisherman and trout fishing to me was just dry flies and then later in in my fly fishing became nymphing and these were bug eating fish and that was fantastic it was about matching the hatch and then uh and then i got into steelhead and hardcore and it was more about uh the challenge but getting the tight line grab on the swing and, and having super aggressive fish and feeling the tug and all that. And, you know, so I was pretty pretty solidly a steelheader when I got to go over to Kimchak, and I was so jazzed about um, that opportunity. But I was expecting trout fishing. And when I got over, it was so far from any trout fishing that I'd ever experienced. The fish were so crazy, so aggressive. We got to fish them on a tight line instead of a dead drift. You got to feel everything. 90% of it was mouse fishing, so you got to see the explosion and the grab as well. Um, and then they were just total shredders. And, and, you know, I mean, 
20 inch fish is your top fish of the summer in California. We take pictures of that 100% of the time. And in Kipchaka, we don't even bother pulling the camera out at 20 inches, right? That's like the average. So we're catching these fish that were absolutely summer steelhead size, even though they're a resident, destroying fish, fi d destroying flies on a tight line. And it was just, it was absolutely incredible. And it was just this mind blowing experience of I'm trout fishing, but this is crazy. This is not like trout fishing that I ever have seen in my entire life. And I've done a bunch of it, you know, it was uh same fish, quite a different mentality. It, and maybe it's just me, and maybe I'm just seeing the best of the photos, but it seems to me that these rainbows are physically different, too. Like, very vibrant, colorful fins, um, strong-looking fish. They're all strong-looking, you know, because they just they bulk up quick. But the crazy part is, I think, I think half the reason why they're ultra-aggressive, right, is, is they spend seven eight months under ice under the white blanket and then when that sun comes out and that river opens up and mammals start swimming across it like man we don't have the luxury of saying no to protein and things come into the river and they're like i'm gonna get it i'm gonna out compete the guy next to me i'm gonna take everything that comes by and they get really strong really quick and they got to be really aggressive to survive if they don't and they get to go into the next river, the next winter skinny, they're going to lose, right? So the winters survive and the winters are aggressive and the winters, ha the winters hammer flies. They just eat. Um, and they eat really fast. Like I already said, I mean, if you can find a fish that has 24 mice in his stomach before they've been digested, I mean, that guy's eating a lot of protein really fast. He's getting huge really fast. He's putting on weight so that he can be a dominant guy and survive a long winter under the ice. They're just, they're incredible. Still the same fish. It's on Karankas Micus. So uh, you mentioned that Kimchak is about the size of California. How many rivers are there and how many rivers have you been able to fish? I actually did a little bit of research on this because I've seen so many different numbers thrown around. I've seen the number 10,000 thrown around. I've seen the number 100,000 thrown around. And it's, it's absolutely an, an, an impossible number to verify, right? Like, what's the definition of a river? <laughs> like, how, how much CFS before it qualifies, right? So the, the 10,000 number is probably main stem drainages. The 100,000 number is probably every five CFS creek coming off of every corner of every volcano, draining out of every stretch of tundra. Um, but there is water coming out of everywhere, and they all have life in them. The place is so undegraded, and that's the whole thing, right? That's what we're going there for is fortunately – this lost piece of dirt was forgotten to the world, right? It was, it, was, it was a barrier during the Cold War between the United States and Russia. They just put a piece of dirt that was worthless there, so if we tried to invade, there was nothing there. Fortunately, when they did that, they didn't know that the place was full. There was everything was there. But it never got touched. There's no dams. There's no deforestation. There's no agriculture. There's no farming. There's no nothing. There's no nothing that has hurt anything. And when you step off the helicopter onto a river that that six people a year are going to see, it's something special, you know? Like if you do this a lot and you go to these rivers and you hear the old timer and you love it, the fishing's great. You go every weekend, religiously, and you hear the old timers say, geez, you should have seen it 50 years ago. We used to walk across the river on their backs, you get off a helicopter and come check, and you see what they're talking about. You're like, this is it, man. This is what the old man was talking about. I can walk across the river on his back. I throw the mouse under that bush. Son, there's a dang rainbow lives under that bush. Turn around around your back. Man, if you drop your back cast, you better hold on. Because the fish is going to grab it on your back. That's awesome. Oh. Um, so we just spent a bit of time talking about uh, rainbows and a little bit about salmon. But you're also involved in the Kamchatka Steelhead Project. 
Uh, what's that about? Oh, man, don't even get me started. <laughs> I mean, I love trout fishing, you know, but I dream about steelhead fishing. And, I mean, I think that was half the thing. Like like I said, my, my guy, Van Warmer, he, he, he taught me how to steelhead fish for real. And he told me that I was going to get Kamchaka when he disappeared, and that happened. And uh, that guy is my hero and stuff. But I think in the back of my head when I took that job, they'd canceled the Kamchaka steelhead project, and it hadn't happened for about five or six years. I remember taking that trout job and being thinking that if I stayed on KSP, the Kamchaka steelhead project, would happen in my time. And... Fortunately, one of my best friends and roommates for a decade was Ryan Peterson. And Peterson was in the travel department with Mike Van Warmer when Mike split. And, and Ryan and I were guiding in Kamchatka. And the idea came back up to revitalize the KSP. <clears throat> and both Ryan and I were crazy passionate about it and be like, we can do it. And the whole thing was, you know, people are like, it's a long way, you know, it's a lot of money, it's a lot of time. And, and, and we, were, we knew that it was going to be worth it. And there was going to be people that were down to do it because it's all we could think about. And if that's all we could think about as steel headers, we knew that there was going to be other people. And the guy who thought of it first, the first guy that looked at that piece of dirt, and he said there's going to be steelhead there and it's going to be the best in the world. The guy's name was Pete Sovereign and he's still super involved today and that's his baby. He's the one that made this happen and still does. And uh, we got in touch with him and we said, let's go. And he said, oh, it's really hard to make it go. And, and both of us were like, man, we're willing to bend over backwards. Let's do this. And he was like, all right, let's go again. And we got the paperwork signed and, and we worked really hard to get it going again. And it is probably the most special thing I've ever done in my entire life. So what are the origins of the Kamchatka Steelhead Project? It was through the government of Russia? No, so uh, it's, it's absolutely, it's a joint research project. It was one of the first friendly things we did after the Cold War uh, between the United States and Russia based on science. Uh, there's one thing that we can agree on and talk about is in the scientific community, you know, discussing fish. And, uh, but, but the brain, the first brain behind it was Pete Sovereign, who's a hardcore steelheader and had a lot of connections in Moscow during the Cold War. His, his history is incredible. And, uh, and he looked at the map and he saw Kamchatka for what it was a beautiful habitat for Pacific salmonids that was untouched. And the day they said that the doors were open, that the Cold War was over, the Iron Curtain was down and we were allowed to get in, Pete was the one that instantly called and said, how do I get over to Kamchatka? And they put him in touch with Moscow State University and in, in touch with an ichthyologist who said, I know something about it. I've been there, I had to walk there, and I know all about it. And he was like, well, I would like to fund a scientific expedition. Let's work together. And the Kim Chaka Steelhead Project started, and it's, it's been the longest-running study on a population of steelhead in the history of the planet. You know, one of the crazy things about steelhead is that there's no commercial value, right? So everybody studies salmon because it's a food source. There's commercial value. There's jobs involved, and there's, there's food involved. Steelhead are just looked right by because... They're too mysterious. You can't gill net them in, in the ocean. You can't feed anybody, right? Because they're solo wanderers. But we started doing this project on steelhead in the Far East just for the science, not for any other thing, not for any money-making or anything. And, uh, and it's, it's turned into just this amazing deal, this amazing wealth of knowledge on steelhead that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. And now... Um, Washington uh, is sending a bunch of their scientists to, to join us in the Kamchatka Steelhead Project and see what we're doing so that they can bring the techniques that we're using back to the United States and use them to the benefit of, 
our declining steelhead populations back home. So it's just it's it's a just a wonderful project. It's probably it's it's on the forefront of all steelhead research on the entire planet. And you're studying steelhead as they are supposed to be. It's not like people in Washington, Oregon, California, where they're looking at steelhead affected by people. Well, that that's that's the absolute top of the entire deal. So, so many of our populations are degraded in the West, in in the Pacific Northwest. You know, we we have all those factors that have contributed to the decline. And what happens is you lose fringe populations. You lose the biodiversity. You lose these these niche populations that, that were, you know, fill in groups that, that would come in early or late and they were they were special, they were unique. And those are the first to go. And so now we sit on these core populations, the heart of the runs in the winter and the heart of the runs in the summer. But it's hard to study what, what the system is supposed to be without the biodiversity. And that's the coolest thing in Kimchak when we go over there and we, we catch a lot of the heart of the population, what we call anadromous A. And anadromous A is what we're looking for. That's what the angler wants, the big boy, the ripper. But the coolest part of the program is catching those fringe populations that we don't see in the Pacific Northwest and be like, man, this is what a healthy steelhead stream should have. It should have a a few half-pounders in every system that were juvenile that came in early, but they're going to run back and come back as giant anadromous A fish. But those are called anadromous B. Then you're going to have some that are that are estuary and then you're going to have some that, that do other life histories. And that's, that's the coolest thing. It's so that we haven't degraded that resource yet. And you get to see the entirety of the biodiversity of a healthy steelhead population. So it, it, hearing about that as an environmentalist, I'm psyched also listening to this as an angler, you have some pretty impressive experiences as a steelheader. Oh, man, that's the part that's out of control, you know? Now, back to the old guy, right, that, you know, 50 years ago, I'd be like, oh, God, you guys are fishing for crumbs now. And those crumbs, man, I'll go out there and work. I'll go fish all winter, right? Fish a day, I'm ecstatic. And those guys are like, man, we used to, we used to take 10 fish home in a day, right? And you're just like, geez, what happened? And we get back over to Kimchak, and I tell people every day on the phone, right, it's still steelhead fishing. It's still steelhead fishing. We're still ecstatic on a fish a day. Zero fish, like, sweet. I'm still ecstatic, right? Like, I'm a steelheader. Yeah. I take pride on being happy on no fish. But in Kimchak, uh, I've seen some of the most explosive days on the face of the earth and just... Had days where we were like, dude, I didn't know that that could possibly even happen, right? We had a day in 2015 on one of the craziest months of steelheading I've ever seen where I had eight anglers and we went 39 for 100 between eight no guys. Way. And I had two guys in my boat and we were 14 for 30. And those 30 weren't grabs, right? Those were fish doing backflips and ripping guys in half and losing fish because they had no choice. The fish chose get off, you know? And you're just like, dude, 30 legit rippers. And, you know, you're just like, gee, many Christmas. I, I can't even imagine if it was like that back home, you know? Like, how could we ever let, let it happen and let that slip away? It's just, it's mind-blowing feel special that I get to go over there. It's really depressing to know that that used to be in our backyard. Yeah, that's unbelievable. Um, certainly, I mean, this is, Eastern Russia is so far. There's so many things that um, I'm not familiar with from culture to transportation to species, species of animals. You've got grizzlies everywhere, right? Oh, yeah. Grizzlies everywhere. And but I, they're great. <laughs> well, I, you and I were still having recently, you've got some grizzly stories. Yeah, yeah, grizzlies are <laughs> phenomenal. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of refreshing to know that we're still not the top predator, right? Like, we can destroy a whole bunch of stuff. We're really, really good at that. 
but it's really special to go out into the wild and go out there and know that you have to have respect for something because you're not top dog out here. You're on their turf, and you better have eyes in the back of your head, and when a stick snaps, you better <laughs> respect it, right? But the thing is, is, is man, they're just, they, they look at you, and you're not even competition. You're just, you're just so, so soft and not hairy. And they just look at you, and you're just like, are you going to get out of my way? And you say, absolutely, I'll move. And then they just cruise right. You know, the only, the only good stories I have in Kamchatka are first week of the season before the salmon show up. You know, then, then you're hooking trout that they're not catching, and they say, man, that's not fair. Let's fight. <laughs> you know, I go, okay, now i got some good stories. But as soon as the fish show up, they're just like, man, we can share. We can totally coexist. And they just look at you. You look at them, and you say, man, why don't you take this run? I'll move to the next one. And then we get in the boat, and we move, and they're total gentlemen. Oh, it's amazing. Only recently has have humans not been in fear of have been been in fear of predators and had to rely on each other and be in community to you know protect each other from bears or wolves or whatever mountain lions um and so you get to a place where you encounter these predators and it reminds you that you're a creature too that lives on a planet absolutely it's probably refreshing and not the top one exactly like i'm just a part of this system now I got no machine. I got no help call. I got nothing. We got these two guys in this old boat. That's cool. And you got two choices, right? There's two choices in nature, fight or flight. <laughs> We're out. Let's go. <laughs> Let him have his piece of the hole. Have a chubby friend. Yeah, yeah. We'll, 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 get, we'll get the next one, man. He can have it. <laughs> Nobody wants to fight a grizzly bear. Um. For you, having had so much experience there, I mean, I think you were there for 40 days this year, right? Yeah, this year was 40 days, and that was a short stretch. Yeah, so you probably have a better sense than anybody from the U.S. of uh, just culture. You've gotten to know people there. And, um, I, mean, I don't even know what to ask. but No, that's a, just a great, great talking point at all, man. You watch the news too much today, and it just bombs me out, you know, where – it seems like the world wants another Cold War, and it's, it's fucking crazy, man. Like, those guys are my brothers. I talk to those guys on Facebook. I talk to those guys on email all the time. Those guys are my friends. And anybody that ever says, like, oh, you hang out with Russians, those guys are the enemy. You know, I got, I'm going to have words to say about it. Because those guys, man, I look them in the eye daily, and they got my back. When we got bears, when we got <laughs> anything, when we got camp to put up, when we got anything to do, those guys got my back, and they'll be my friends for eternity, real friends. So, uh, I mean, it's easy to make the case that uh, Kamchatka is the place to fish, um, but uh, many, maybe for the average angler, it seems so far that it getting there is a challenge. Um, for you, you'd set people up to head there all the time um what are some travel considerations how hard is it to get there etc i mean it goes it, i think it goes like this the, the summer trout fishing now is a walk in the park we have a four hour flight out of anchorage right it's so easy you just fly up to anchorage have dinner wake up jump on a puddle jumper and you're in kamchak aboard in a helicopter it's just so easy but the thing is, steelhead program, we fly the long way. But, you know, people think of it as the long way, and that's like an issue. But it's not any longer than flying to the, to the tip of South America to go fishing in Chile and Argentina. It's, it's shorter than getting to the Seychelles. There's so many other places that don't have a shortcut, right? And you just take it because that's the only way to get there. I think a lot of people think Kamchatka's a long way because there's a shortcut in the shortcut's ridiculously convenient. But the long way is kind of like you're paying your dues. And I think in some regard, it's even better because you get to stop in Moscow and actually feel like you're in Russia. Cool. You get to go see Red Square, hang out at the Kremlin. Back, like, okay, man, I'm in <laughs> Mother Russia, you know? 
And then when you get over there and then you see the experience, you're like, wait a minute, that wasn't so far and it was totally worth it. And the thing is, is if it was super close and super easy and super convenient, guess what? It wouldn't exist, Yeah. right? It would have already been taken advantage of. So that's the thing. If you want to see the best in the world, if you want to see the untouched, man, you got to have a little bit of commitment to go a little bit out of your way to get there. That's its protection. So it's far enough and easy enough at the same time. Yeah, I mean, right now with that flight, it's only a weekly flight. And like I said, I mean, we're, there's 40 guys a week on that flight. So it's not like there's a whole bunch of traffic. Right. But for those 40 guys, it's awful dang easy. I mean, it's never been easier in the history of Kimchaka tourism for North Americans to get there during the summer months, during the peak of the trout season. So we take advantage of that, and you're just like, geez, Louise, this thing's and I, 10 times easier to get to than Argentina and Chile. And I think that iconic image that people see, when I th- or at least imagine for Kamchatka, is that old Soviet helicopter. Oh, is that it- thing is beast mode. <laughs> is it scary? Absolutely not, man. That thing's like a <laughs> flying tank. <clears throat> you know, lots of people get really, really worried about that thing. And, like, I mean, nobody, you don't ever want to be thinking about fearful stuff when you're traveling. But if, if that's what's holding you back from Kamchatka, compare the statistics of how many otters and beavers crash <laughs> in Alaska. Right, right. In the last five years, I know of five insta- instances where float planes in Alaska have crashed and killed people. <laughs> in the last 20 years of Kamchatka fly fishing, exactly zero MI8s have gone down with people on board. Exactly zero. They have a 100% track record. The only MI8s that ever crash are because some guy, usually a giant bigwig politician who thinks he's a badass, <laughs> forces a pilot to fly in conditions that he shouldn't have. He says, you know, we shouldn't fly. It's bad weather. And the guy says, do you know how, who I am? Get this bird in the air. And they hit a wall. <laughs> But if you listen to the pilot and trust his judgment, these things are absolute workhorses, man. They will get you and 12 other guys and five guides and cooks, five rafts, all your gear, all your equipment, 10,000-pound payload in and out with no problem. And when you get off of it, you'll take your pictures of the helicopter and be like, that was the baddest-ass machine I've ever been in my entire life. And then you set up your raft and you're doing the most remote fly fishing that you could possibly imagine. Absolutely. You're like, oh, I'm lost. I'm never going to get out of here. And at the end, I'll call him on a satellite phone and give him GPS coordinates, and he'll be here in 2.2. That's amazing. That's true fly fishing exploration and adventure. It's the craziest adventure I've ever, always been on, man. <laughs> and my only, the, my only goal all, all year is to see who's going to get me the next plane ticket over there. That's awesome. Well, to check out more, and I highly encourage that, uh, check out theflyshop.com, uh, specifically uh, backslash travel, backslash Kamchatka. It is um, truly everything you could imagine, aggressive, predatory, healthy, big trout in the most remote setting imaginable, um, theflyshop.com. Thanks, Justin. My pleasure.